Few things are more amusing to me than when I hear people try to extract life lessons from jazz musicians. But I see this all the time. I see people writing books of how Miles Davis can teach you to be a better manager or how you can learn how to lead a more fulfilling life through Thelonious Monk. And I have to laugh at these because I really think if you went to work in the morning and you acted like Miles Davis, you would be fired before lunchtime. These people were prickly. They were difficult. And although we can learn things from them, I think in many ways we have to learn to avoid certain things they did, which would just get us into ridiculous amounts of trouble if we tried to apply them in our everyday life. Now that said, I'm going to make an exception. I'm going to make an exception for John Coltrane, that great saxophonist, who left an amazing legacy behind in music, but I do think that with John Coltrane we can learn things outside of music and maybe even apply them to our everyday life. John Coltrane is famous for his saxophone work. He set a standard that even today, more than a half century after he died, no one really has surpassed in terms of improvisational brilliance and creativity. But Coltrane was a complex person, and you can't reduce everything he did to just what he did on the horn. It's interesting to note that a year before he died, John Coltrane was visiting Japan. And a jazz critic went up to him and asked an open-ended question. He said, John, where do you see yourself in 10 years' time? Coltrane thought about it and he said, in 10 years, I'd like to be a saint. Now, what an amazing thing for a musician to say in an interview. And we never got the opportunity to see John Coltrane on his path to sainthood because he was dead just a few months later. But it's interesting to ask, what would he have done if he had lived? because it's clear he was reaching some kind of limit in what he was doing musically. Just several months after the Japan visit, Coltrane gave a concert in Philadelphia at Temple University. And this was an amazing event, but also a very controversial one, because Coltrane started playing music way beyond what the audience expected. Many of them got up and left. They couldn't handle what was happening. At one point, he even puts down his saxophone and he starts vocalizing. It's not really singing, it's like yodeling or chanting or wailing, screaming. And he starts pounding on his chest with his fist. What is this? But the way I look at it, Coltrane was saying, I've done everything I can do on the horn. I've got to reinvent myself again now from first principles. And I think if he had lived, you would have seen him get involved in many non-musical activities, dealing with his spirituality, his philosophy, his approach to life. People who visited John Coltrane at his home were always amazed at the books, just the sheer number of them. There were books everywhere, and they weren't always the kind of books you would expect to see with a musician. He had Aristotle or Plato, Krishnamurti, the autobiography of a yogi, Edgar Cayce, Rosicrucians, Almost every transcendental and spiritual tradition was part of his arsenal. And it soon became clear that for John Coltrane, music was important, but it was part of a much larger vision. And I think if you look at the very specifics, you can see that he was anticipating the future. I'd like to make a case for John Coltrane as a kind of prophet or even a kind of seer. Consider his great landmark, A Love Supreme, from 1964. This was a music about love, but this higher kind of love, a transcendental love, a spiritual love. Now, it's fascinating to note that three years later, you had the summer of love, which went mass market. Everybody, hippies, the whole general public was understanding there was a summer of love, this higher kind of love, and you had Woodstock. But John Coltrane was there years before. And he also anticipated the New Age movement. You know, in the 1980s, people say, well, music is part of a spirituality, transcendence, meditation, mysticism. But John Coltrane was doing that 20 years before. And then think of all the things he did in world music, even before it had the name. World music wasn't a term people used back in the 1960s. But Coltrane was there at the forefront, exploring the musical traditions of Africa, Asia, the whole world. 
Today we like to say that the world is connected because of the internet. The world is flat, we've got the global village, but John Coltrane didn't need an internet to reach out and touch the whole world. He was doing that through his music, through his mindset, through his attitudes back in the 1960s. So I don't know where John Coltrane would have gone if he had lived, but I do know that he would have pushed beyond boundaries and that he would have taught us things. And so I asked myself, what can we learn from Coltrane beyond just how to play the saxophone? or how to do a jazz improvisation. And I think we can learn many things. And I say, look at the values that John Coltrane espoused in his life. We don't even need to think about what he might have done if he had lived many years later. Just look at what he did during his life. And these are the things he valued. Learning, respect, transcendence, spirituality, an openness to people all over the world and what they have to contribute to our culture, interchange, dialogue. These are timeless values. In fact, they're more important now, perhaps, than they were even back then. So I would say let's admire John Coltrane as a musician, but let's admire him for all the other things he left us. And I would suggest that when John Coltrane died more than 50 years ago, he was ahead of his time. He is still ahead of his time today.